Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. You know, it is uh, it is that time. It is that week. America faces a major decision, uh, like, right uh, today. Buffalo Bills or Seattle Seahawks, who do you got? <laughs> also, here is Jeremy John. Yeah, it, was, uh, it, it is true. Uh, Seattle Seahawks, that's exactly right. I love how the fact that it's election week, and you're like, the country, it's football. What is this election? you speak of oh by the way should point out <laughs> ladies and gentlemen jeremy johns making his, oh! his first oh my God. official appearance last week we celebrated uh ken napsaw coming on now full-time with us and today we commemorate jeremy johns now here full-time part of the crew welcome to the show man thank you it was a long track i'm not gonna lie 1100 miles is actually quite a long ways to, to move your crap but uh with two dogs in your car with two dogs right in my back car who finally just anxiety themselves out and started sleeping about seven hours into the drive uh but no it's great to be here seriously it's, a, it's an exciting exciting thing i love new stuff and uh, i love the fact that let's just talk movies and go crazy all right. That's a good world. That's well, the way to do it. That's my world. As you mentioned, John. Also, here's Ken Knapsack. <laughs> hey, Glicks, for having me back. I had a lot of fun making my debut last week. It's a great team. I'm so happy that Jeremy got lost on the way to Seattle and ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> also, That's here's Mark Ellis. I remember when I was the new guy on this panel. <laughs> it was the dark ages. <laughs> President Clinton was just a senator, and hotel magnate Trump wasn't our supreme leader yet. <laughs> Oh, Good and day. listen, I should let you guys know that as we announced back in September, for those of you watching us live, because right now we do this show live Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But as we announced back in September, we are moving the show to 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have just been sitting around waiting for Jeremy to get here before you know, doing too many changes all at once. We're going to Jeremy get a, a week under his belt of being here, and then we'll make the time <laughs> shift next Monday. So Monday, November 14th, is when we go from 11 a.m., to 10 a.m. We hope that will make your lives just a little bit better. So you're telling me we are waiting for a guy who regularly stays up until 5 a.m. <laughs> editing his videos. Are you yes. going to be able to wake up? That's exactly I was going to say that. That's how the conversation went. I was like, John, I'm not a morning person. He was like, we'll make you one. <laughs> no, <laughs> so here we so are. This dude gets up at the crack of noon normally. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, that was one of the major talking points in discussing whether or not he should come on full time. Is yep. now, now, when the clock still says a.m., do I have to be up? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes so I look forward to the text. Hey, buddy, you going to Taco Bell this morning? Because they got a good breakfast. <laughs> yep. Uh, all my fans know about 3, 4 a.m. That's when the videos go up. That might be changing, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> all right. Let's get to the first story today. All right. According to a report from Deadline, Mr. Robot star Rami Malek is attached to play Freddie Mercury in the long and development biopic entitled Bohemian Rhapsody with Brian Singer also in talks to direct. Singer confirmed the news on his Instagram account sharing a photo of the group confirming his involvement as well as Malik's. The Theory of Everything writer Anthony McCartan penned the script with production looking to shoot early next year. John, thoughts on Rami Malik as Freddie Mercury in the Brian Singer directed Bohemian Rhapsody. Well, as, as far as Malik goes, I don't watch Mr. Robot. I'm one of the few guys in the office that doesn't actually watch the show. I know, however, the two just won the Emmy for mm -hmm. Best Actor in a Drama, so that's a good thing. I love the fact that Brian Singer is directing this. You know, a lot of people, when they think of Brian Singer and his directing, what they think about is the X-Men films, and that's fine. X-Men 1, awesome. X-Men 2, awesome. X-Men Days of Future Past, awesome. X-Men Apocalypse, eh. Right. But he also did, like, Valkyrie, which I think is a tremendously underrated film. He did The Unusual Suspects, which is one of my top 10 favorite films of all time. I think this is a great fit. It, I was still interested, though, I'll be honest with you, for a long time, Sasha Barrett Cohen was attached to this. And I that idea really grew on me. Eventually he left, Ben Whitshaw came in, Q came in, and he was going to do it. I thought he would have been an interesting choice, but this is a strong a choice. You got the the reigning Emmy winner. That's a great choice. That's fine with me. So anyway, Mark, what do you think about this? You know, the Brian Singer news is the first thing I thought of as well because it didn't seem like the right choice. And then I sat back and thought about it. I'm like, well, he directed a lot of X-Men movies. Freddie Mercury was clearly a mutant because that is not a normal <laughs> human being. When you watch that guy in 85 at Live Aid at Wembley Stadium, he's crushing it on such a level as he did throughout his career that he's not like a normal person. So in order to play him, you have to have some real chops. I don't watch Mr. Robot either. I know this guy from that weird part in Need for Speed when he takes all his clothes off as he's quitting his job. 
He's got some flamboyance to him. That was him. I totally forgot about he that. Could. Sorry I brought that up if you're watching, dude. <laughs> I think he's going to do a fine job as Freddie Mercury as well as anybody can do. You can't hope to replenish what Freddie Mercury brought to the table. Sasha Baron Cohen, I thought, was a great choice. This is not a bad backup. I'm excited about this. Kenny, you like this? I am excited for the beginning of the Live Aid cinematic universe. I think we can start. You can throw in a U2 movie. You can throw in a lot of things. Uh, Bob Geldof, we got a lot of things here. Uh, this was a decision. When, when, when this came across, I was like, really? And then you kind of think about it. Yeah, I mean, look at that picture. It's not just about looking like uh, Freddie Mercury. It's can you capture that that stage presence? That's one of the perhaps the greatest frontman of all time. You yep. mentioned the Live Aid performance. Watch that. It is mm -hmm. riveting, and, and, and it's a great story. Um, I was interested in the Sasha Baron Cohen casting too, mm -hmm. just because that's such an intriguing actor. Uh, I'm not worried as much as singers. Maybe other people. You're right. You say you. Th think that name and you think a popcorn fluff uh, x-men movie now or some a big superhero movie but he's got some chops uh but this casting this is a guy who can act i don't watch mr robot either we've got <laughs> you better so come alone. through we are with robot toe. watching but <laughs> the guy can act he just won an emmy it's an outside the box choice i'm behind that what do you think jeremy well um one of my best friends when i told him i don't watch mr robot he looked <laughs> like he was gonna beat me to death with his belt uh but uh, i i agree with you guys the actor's great i i wanted to see sasha barra cohen also because i love it when an actor you don't think in a dramatic biopic you get to see the depth and layers that they have and you're like oh my gosh you actually you have that talent you know i wanted to see that with him um but this is a good choice. I agree with you, Brian Singer, like apt pupil, uh, usu oh, yeah. usual suspects. He might be franchised out at this point if Apocalypse kind of pointing this to the fact that it's like, eh, maybe he should do something a little more personal rather than these big X-Men movies. Um, it all looks great to me. I, I really want to watch this. I really do. All right. What's next? According to Deadline, Universal Pictures is now in development on a live-action Voltron movie with X-Men and Watchmen scribe David Hayter writing the script. Universal Pictures and its parent company, NBC Universal, recently purchased DreamWorks Animation and in the deal received the rights to the Voltron property. The studio would not comment on where the project is headed, only that the project is still up in the air because it is an inherited project. Once the script is finished, the studio will then make a decision on which direction to take the live-action movie. Jeremy, what do you think about a live-action Voltron movie at Universal? I'm going to eat this up. I really am. It's a live-action Voltron movie. How can I not? I have a Voltron t-shirt, for God's sakes. And David <laughs> Hayter, um, who uh, did pen, he's about 50-50. He's penned the first couple X-Men movies. He also pens some garbage. But uh, he's also the voice of Solid Snake in the Metal Gear Solid series, so i got to love him for <laughs> I that. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, he really is. He's the voice actor who does Snake. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the Power Rangers movie coming out, for what you... For what you see, you, you see it, and you're like, that's probably not going to be good. But I'm intrigued because it's a part of my childhood. That's how I see Voltron. I want to see the big uh, robots fight. Let's just bring it on, man. Give me some Voltron. You know what? I'm, uh, I'm going to go a little bit different on the Power Go Rangers. I've been saying for a long time, this Power Rangers movie is a bad idea. No. I'm on board with it now. That trailer, I'm going to tell you, the trailer did it for me. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not jumping on my skin for, yeah. for this Power Rangers right. movie, but I am now officially intrigued with, yeah. with the movie because I think it looks good. With the Voltron thing, look, they just had the new animated series come out. I believe it was on Netflix with Voltron, which wasn't bad, actually. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty good. My one requirement going in, now, I don't like to say, if this movie is to work, it's got to do this. I, I'm not usually like that. But my one requirement is that it be the Lion Voltron and not the 10 various little Tinker Toy Voltron formation stuff. That You just All put right. that stuff away. If it's the Lion Voltron, I'm on board. I think this thing has got big franchise potential. And mm -hmm. that's what all the studios are looking for right now, understandably so, is properties that have franchise potential. This is one of them. The reaction to the cartoon has been good. This is a smart choice, I think. Kenny, what do you think? Uh, look, you guys know I have a lot of toys in my room even now, but uh, I don't have any Voltron toys. Uh, I'm not a huge fan, but I know a lot of people are, so that's why I think there's giant potential as a franchise. I'm actually surprised it took this long. My worry <laughs> is this could just kind of go into that Transformers, Power Rangers, right. Pacific Rim kind of void where they all kind of look the same. They look like cool, sleek robots, but not like the toys we grew up on, and it just kind of be a big, loud mess. But franchise potential, of course there is. There's a lot of fans. Mark. Kenny, if you're worried about a Pacific Rim knockoff, how about this? Pacific Rim is also co-financed by Universal. Shared universe, baby. <laughs> Let's get those five robot lines to fight some 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 Jaegers, some Kaiju. It is going to be a maelstrom in Kenny's bathtub when he finally gets the Voltron toys. I agree with you. I, I like the five Voltrons that we all grew up in and knew. And I wasn't really aware of them when I was a little kid because I was just so busy mainlining He-Man, anything I could get into my veins that I didn't know about that. I didn't know about Thundercats. But people of a 
certain age are aware of Voltron. Whether we know the lore or not, we use Voltron as a verb. Anytime we're combining things and adding things onto to make them bigger, if I'm taking a shot of something and putting it into a beer, I am Voltroning alcohol. <laughs> if I go to McDonald's and get fries and I go to Burger King and get their spicy dipping sauce, I am Voltroning fast food together. This is what you can do. It's called Voltron. You're going to be able to sell people on it, make it look cool live action. We could have a kick-ass movie on our hands. Yeah, and if this movie does kick ass, you bring up a good point because I've wanted to see a great He-Man movie for a very long time. And if this one oh. crushes, I would like to think that we could finally get that He-Man movie done. But can you bring up a very interesting point about the toys? Not only does this thing, does this IP carry with it the potential for franchising movies, you've got huge dollars they could also make with the toy franchises as well and, and, and licensing those things, couldn't you? Absolutely, you can do it. I'm a big fan of Robotech. I'm a big fan of Mask. Those are the cartoons. I kind of Mask. Mask. <laughs> Mobile Armored Strike Command, man. Uh, take down Miles <laughs> Venom. Um, so same thing too. Uh, a studio exec's going to look at it. What's the story? What's the movie? Ooh, but what do we got here on the side? You can redo comics. You can redo books, toys, and absolutely that's what they're thinking. Voltron, a re-released line of movie Voltron toys. Jeremy is going to be a carload full. <laughs> right next to my moving. Megazord, baby. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Marvel does it again. The studio's debut of the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange, opened above expectations with $85 million and at number one at the weekend box office. It marks the 10th largest opening for a Marvel movie, finishing just behind the November record holder Thor The Dark World. DreamWorks Animation's Trolls took the number two spot with $45.6 million. At number three was Mel Gibson's critically acclaimed Hacksaw Ridge, which earned $14 point eight million. Boo a Medea Halloween took the number four <laughs> spot with seven point eight million. And at number five, Inferno took in six point three million, dropping fifty eight percent in its second weekend with a domestic cum now at only twenty six million. Mark, thoughts on Doctor Strange's box office this past weekend. Well my thoughts on the top five Ashley are that trolls did very well. I was impressed with trolls. Hacksaw Ridge doing what you would expect. Oscar bait that might be a little tiny controversial to do. Boo surprised me as well because <laughs> it's past Halloween kids and <laughs> We still raked in almost $8 million on a smaller amount of screens, but obviously Doctor Strange is the story, and not just what it did domestically, because I think most of us were predicting that it was going to be on the higher end of the box office analyst predictions. Like, it might be $85 million. That's exactly what it did. The international box office for this thing. I mean, I don't know what the appeal of Doctor Strange is to everybody around the world. Maybe it's just that Benedict Cumberbatch is that international gynecologist that we all knew he could be. <laughs> so now, Doctor Strange opening everywhere and crushing it. This opens up even more portals, if you will, for the MCU. I am shocked at how well it is doing. Worldwide right now, it stands at $325 million. Ooh. It's broken even. Basically, a first weekend done. Everything now from here on out is going to be gravy. Not surprised about this. I believe I called 85. They were expecting 75 to 85. I thought it would be on the high end of that. That's exactly what we got for a property that nobody knew anything about. For this thing to hit 85, and remember I said this a couple weeks ago, this thing could hit $85 million, and if it does, there's going to be some people out there who says, well, why did it only make $85 million? Mm -hmm. like, are, you, are we so, got our expectations so screwed up that there are actually going to be people out there today that goes, well, $85 million, that's kind of a failure. No, it is not, sir. This is a huge result for them. This is going to get have good box office legs because the reviews are very solid. The fans are enjoying it. It's a great movie. I'm glad. I am disappointed with the results of Hacksaw Ridge. Because as of this moment, there's still a bunch of the Oscar contenders I haven't seen yet, okay? So that's to come. As of this moment to me, Hacksaw Ridge is the best movie of 2016. I was absolutely floored by this. This is a masterpiece in filmmaking. Great acting, great direction. When the action does start, the action is wonderful too, but you walk out feeling powerfully moved when you see this film. I was hoping for better. I knew it would probably not crack 20, but I was hoping it would do better than it did. So those are the things that stand out to me. What about you, Kenny? Which stands out to well, you? You walked out of Hacksaw Ridge moved. I walked out of Doctor Strange feeling like I just came back from Burning Man, which is a, a <laughs> testament to what Marvel can kind of put out there now. Once you get a talking raccoon uh, loved by the public, they can do anything now. This kind of proved it. Uh, and it is weird. This is what the 10th greatest, biggest opening for Marvel. <laughs> Only the 10th at 85 million in November. This is, you know, something that we're used to seeing in a blockbuster summer capacity. It was, uh, it's still a superhero movie. It's still got that big baddie at the end and you got to fight to save things, but it was definitely different. It had some spiritual undertones to it, some deeper things that, uh, that I liked in it, and the fact that they can make this much money with that just shows that Marvel can probably do no wrong for the long time to come. Jeremy, what stands out to you about the report? Yeah, it's a... It 
I remember when Thor was coming out, and my friend and I were like, there is no way. I mean, you can do Iron Man, you can do the Incredible Hulk, but there's no way you can bring gods into it. And they did it, and it worked. And then they were like, Guardians of the Galaxy. And we were like, all right, so if there's a test for them, it's going to be this one. Because mm. Guardians of the Galaxy is going to be a really hard one. These misfits coming together, it's going to be so different. If this fails, it might be the one that fails. It worked. And then it was like Doctor Strange. It was like, okay, here's how it is. If this doesn't work. And so now it's like, <laughs> it's Pixar at this point. It's Pixar 2. It's like, all right, you guys are good. I have not yet seen the Marvel equivalent of Cars 2. I hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> but uh, it, it's one of these things where when Marvel's coming out with a movie, you can always reliably think that it's probably going to be good and it's going to do well and emulate everything you said on Hacksaw Ridge. I love that movie, too. I just want to remind you guys, too, for Doctor Strange, we have both a non-spoilers review up on our YouTube channel right now at youtube.com slash colliderviews, and we have a spoiler review as well. Make sure, if you've seen the movie already, make sure you check out the spoiler review as well and give us your thoughts there. All right, guys, we've reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? Looks like Justice League has cast its big baddie. According to the rap, Kieran Hines, who plays Mance Raider from Game of Thrones, has already wrapped work as Steppenwolf, bringing the character to screen using performance capture technology. Additionally, the rap reports that Steppenwolf will look different than he did in the Batman vs. Superman deleted scene in which the character first appeared. Ken, buy or sell Kieran Hines as Steppenwolf in Justice League. I buy it. I buy it like a villager looking for the last chicken on a cart. And, and I'm telling you, <laughs> because he has got a great resume. He's been around. Check him out in the Laura Croft movie all those years ago. He was great. But I am a Game of Thrones nut, and the gravitas and weight he brought to a very important side character, unfortunately a little more side on the show than it is in the books, uh, he just dominated every scene. He's going to light the biggest fire the North has ever seen. He was amazing. And this type of thing for uh, you know what we had with this uh, last movie, Bat v. Soups, a little confusing, a little, little uh, malign. Now you're going to have a... a guy playing the the big baddie the big villain that's going to top the first and 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 you need someone uh, I, i'm glad it's not someone younger or flashier it is just a solid character actor who can come in and bring some weight what do you think jeremy yeah i was a big fan of rome on hbo and he played julius caesar in rome for the entire first season so if you want to see this guy and everything he is for an entire season of hbo glory uh, season one of Rome, man, go for it. It's, he's one of those actors where when he's in a room and he's playing a role like that, you know this guy is in charge of everybody in that room. I'm pumped to see him play, was he Darkseid's abusive uncle? Like if, <laughs> if Darkseid's gonna have an abusive uncle, I'd like it to be that guy. He's, <laughs> he is, uh, he's born to be wild, baby. I'm going to buy this because not only is this guy just a strong and has presence, when you look at the supporting roles that he's played over the years, even in films, whether you're talking about uh, Munich. He was so good in Munich. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Road to Perdition. You're talking about There Will Be Blood. You're talking, then you stop talk about his stuff in Rogue. This is really solid stuff. There's no reason not to buy this. What do you think? Yeah, and I'm sure Kenny was watching the Lara Croft movie for Kieran Hines' amazing performance <laughs> in that. But he is a guy who lends heavy metal thunder. He lends gravitas to whatever movie he's going to be in. I like when they add talent to an already talented cast. And the addition of Steppenwolf into this universe is very intriguing all of a sudden because there's one storyline run in the comics that's Steppenwolf is kind of like the general or the, the right-hand man of Darkseid, who we've already seen intonations that he might be playing a factor going forward in Justice League. So to have Steppenwolf be there as a looming presence, looking for all these things that might be in Atlantis, that might be somewhere else, it's a very, very cool prospect for DC. All right, what's next? With over 15 years spent writing for Marvel's X-Men comics, Chris Claremont scripted many unforgettable arcs like Days of Future Past with John Byrne and helped to develop the fan-favorite Wolverine into one of the franchise's most recognizable heroes. Now the surge of the comics' popularity in the 90s has fallen off in recent years, with Claremont blaming it on Hollywood. Here's what he told Hugh Sheridan at New York Comic Con via Bleeding Cool. I guarantee you that if 10 years ago, when Marvel was approached by Disney, if the X-Men film rights were owned by Marvel Studios, Studios and not Fox, the X-Men would probably still be the Paramount book in the canon. The reason for the emphasis on the other titles is because Marvel slash Disney control the ancillary film rights, whereas all the film rights for the Fantastic Four and the X-Men are controlled by Fox, who has no interest in the comic books. John Byersell Claremont's comments about Fox having no interest in comic books. On one hand, you
opinion that this guy brings to the table. And certainly there is an aspect of causality here whenever you have, you know, the intermingling of different mediums of entertainment, whether it's the printed page with comic books and the big screen and how do those two relate and, and what have you. However, the premise that he brings up, this idea that he guarantees if that the X-Men had the focus and attention from the movie studios of Disney and Marvel, like the existing characters now of Iron Man, Thor, the Incredible Hulk, what have you, the X-Men would be selling huge right now. Well, okay, let's take a look at it for a second. So let's bring up this first graphic. The X-Men, right now, the, the dominant comic right now is the Uncanny X-Men. And in September, its sales were 42,700 issues were sold. Okay, so that doesn't sound great. That doesn't sound huge. So they are not owned by Marvel Studios for the movie rights, and they get 47,700. Well, then, according to Chris's theory, then, if X-Men were getting the attention that the movie characters like Captain America and all the rest of them were getting, it would be huge. Okay, well, then let's take a look at those characters like Captain America. How are they selling in the comics right now? Captain America Steve Rogers got 50,000. Captain America Sam Wilson, 28,000. The Mighty Thor comic is get, sold 46,000. The Invincible Iron Man sold 48,000. And the Totally Awesome Awesome Hulk, which is the top title with Hulk, is 26,000. These are, are all roughly on par with the X-Men sales. So I, I understand what Chris is saying, but when you actually get down to the data and you actually look at the numbers, Marvel putting emphasis on these great characters is not showing any significant improvement over that. Here's an in another interesting numbers. Those are the big numbers, right? You know what the top three comic sales in September, and September, by the way, is the most recent numbers that we have. You know what the top three comic sales were? All Batman titles. Batman Episode 6, Batman Episode 7, and I believe Detective Comics, I think that was number two, all selling over 136,000. Character, which by the way, does not have a currently strong movie franchise <laughs> that the audience and, and the critics were kind of split on, yet those are the top three issues quadrupling, well, not maybe not quadrupling, at least tripling the numbers of the Avengers numbers. So I, I just don't think the data backs up Chris's a theory here. I don't know, Kenny, how do you see this? I'm new here, John, so I don't know if instead of buy or sell, can I put something on layaway and thinking about <laughs> it, about it later? Um, I, I actually understand, I can understand what he's saying, that there's this emphasis on Marvel and, and maybe you've seen something in the movie theater that you liked and then you didn't like the X-Men, so you're not going to get the comic. You didn't like Fantastic Four. I understand that, but it sounds slightly like sour grapes. Uh, well, uh, Washington Post put an article in July saying that June of this year was the highest sales for comic books since December 1997. Now, I go to my shop every week or to a Northridge, I'm there, I'm buying my Star Wars comics, my Velvet, my Saga, all that kind of stuff, and I'm not fighting crowds, and I heard a lot of people in the comic industry that say, don't assume that because of the movies that we're doing well. Uh, Jesse Snyder, musician, son of Dee Snyder, also a comic book writer, he, a couple years ago, started a campaign to kind of save comics and educate people that, hey, there's this entire world, you've seen the Iron Man in the theater, come read all about it. So I can understand, but the numbers don't necessarily lie. These are big, and it's hard to measure, too, because if you say, well, uh, a distributor's bought $300 million in comics, that doesn't necessarily mean sold, because it's about what the shop owners order and anticipation of selling. So maybe there's a little hole to crawl in there and say, well, maybe they're not selling as much as the numbers would say, but it's still a booming industry right now by the numbers. Jeremy, do you think, do you buy the theory that perhaps the, reason, the fact that Fox owns the movie rights to X-Men instead of Marvel is the reason why X-Men isn't selling more? No, um, and I'm really glad you didn't go to me first because after you broke it all down with math, logic, and reason, I was like, don't say, Jeremy, what do you think? Don't say, Jeremy, what do you think? Um, I, I can definitely can't say this from experience for myself. This is just me. This is Jeremy says. Um, I got into comic books more because of the comic book movies. They intrigued mm, me enough, and right. I did exactly what Ken was talking about, where I was like, I want to know more about these characters. And so I did that, and I realized, oh, the greatest Joker ever made was uh, Scott Snyder's Joker in uh, the Endgame and uh, Death of the Family. That's just the way I see it. But uh, yeah, and uh, one of my buddies who works at a comic book store in Washington, it's a great comic book store too, um, he was saying that Guardians of the Galaxy, they couldn't sell the things. And the movie comes out and they couldn't keep it on the shelves. The right. things were flying out the door. So there is that element of intrigue of people going, well, I saw that, now I want to see this. I just think it's, uh, I mean, like you said, it's all on par. I don't, I don't get how, well, that studio owns this. Well, then that means they're doing better than that studio owning this. That means it's not, I mean, the comic books are going to be the comic books. The X-Men are going to sell the X-Men. 
And uh, the top three Marvel characters for comic books are Wolverine, uh, Spider-Man, and Deadpool in, in no seem, particular order. It does seem like in the last decade we've had a reversal of philosophy. On the one hand, it used to be, hey, we've got these comic books that are popular. Maybe those can sell the movies. Yeah, right. Now it's, it feels like it's totally reversed. Yeah. Now it's like, no, the movies yeah. are the first thing. Maybe they can help sell comic books. I don't know, Mark, how do you see this whole thing? I actually buy Claremont's comments because back when I was collecting comic books, I would go to my shop and X-Men was the most popular comic you could get. There was obviously Batman and Superman dying caused a big stir, but I'd go there and I'd look for the Uncanny X-Men and then I'd get my funny comics like a bone or a milk and cheese. But what now oh, is Oh God, I love milk and cheese milk so and cheese much. Milk and cheese was so funny. You so also good. check that out. But X-Men should not be tied with any other Marvel title. They should have the lead. I dare say, John, if the Patriots are playing and they're going up against the Browns, you do not want to end that game tied because you're mm. better than what the Browns are bringing to the table. And here, X-Men should be the most popular comic, so they should be leaps and bounds ahead of other Marvel properties. The reason why they're tied is because Marvel has done such a good job with the films making their stories into franchises. The part about Claremont's comments I'm going to sell a little bit is that he seems to be saying that Marvel isn't as focused on, on, on story development as a whole where they care more about slapping franchise stuff on there. I think that Marvel does care about that stuff. And I think Fox should as well because it could be another cash cow for Fox. I'm going to agree, too, that after this Infinity War stuff plays itself out, I think that's when Marvel comes knocking on Fox's door and is like, hey, what do you have in X-Men? We'll take your Fantastic Four if you're going to throw that in the trunk as well. All right, what's next? Quinn Tarantino has been talking about retiring from filmmaking for no. years now and set an official cap on his work back in 2014 when he told international buyers at AFM that he would retire after his 10th film. Now at this year's Adobe Max Creativity Conference in San Diego, Tarantino doubled down on his statement saying he's sticking to that 10 film limit and will in fact retire after his 10th film. Mark Byersell, Quentin Tarantino retiring after his 10th film. I sell this like a lot of people would be selling KISS tickets. You know why? Because <laughs> KISS had a retirement tour. You know when it was? 1996. They're going to be at the Forum next year, kids. That's who Quentin Tarantino is. He makes a big splash about, oh man, this is the last time ever. And then he gets the itch. He gets Jones in for it, which is fine. He's an artist. He's passionate. He's emotional. And he opens his mouth a lot and stuff comes out. And a lot of times he talks about how I don't want to do this anymore. I want to retire. Because Quentin Tarantino is a guy who's going to stand up for what he believes in artistically about film. And there's a lot of things that annoy him about the movie industry now. But when he stays quiet and when he's not working on anything for too long, he gets the itch, and I love that that happens. I love that I sell the crap out of these comments because I want this guy to continue making movies or art, do something in TV or Netflix for a long time. There's no truth to this whatsoever. John. I completely sell these comments because Quentin Tarantino is a creative person force and when you are a creative force you are passionate and that does come through remember not so long ago he said that's it i'm not making hateful eight not gonna do it not making hateful eight well guess what hateful eight is now on dvd you can get that and it's totally there because he i think he believed it when he said he wasn't gonna do it but he's a passionate guy he's a creative force he thinks you know what i can make this a damn good movie so i'm gonna do it i do believe that he believes he is retiring after 10 films I think he believes it. But once he gets done that 10th film and the next great idea hits his head, because he's a creative force, he is not going to be able to just sit on it. He is going to continue to make movies, so I completely sell the idea that he's going to be done. What do you think, Kenny? Um, <laughs> I want to sell it. It makes sense. I come from the world of professional wrestling. Ric Flair's been retired for a long time. You can still see him in action sometimes. It's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, P Barry Sanders walks away from the Detroit Lions. CM Punk watches, walks away from wrestling to chase a dream. Quentin Tarantino seems just egotistical enough to be like, I'm done, enjoy it, and prove some weird point to Wait, <laughs> I might buy this because it just seems like something he would do. Now, when is that 10th film going to be? He could make one next year and then put in a 10-year uh, gap where he runs no, like a, that's true. Uh, a yogurt yeah. shop near, next to the New Beverly Cinema or something that he already owns and just uh, and just wait a while and all of a sudden make that 10th film at 70 years of age and be like, I told you I would, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to buy it in a weird way. Jeremy? I'm selling this. I mean, how many, I, I'm with you guys. More often than not, you see uh, 
creative people who say I'm retiring that come back rather than people who retire and stay retired. I think Quentin Tarantino, like you said, he's going to, he's going to retire. He's going to, after his 10th film, he's going to be done and he's going to be in his cabin. He's just going to get this <laughs> inspiration from somewhere. And then it's gonna, he's going to realize like, wait, I can't tell that story because I said I was retired. And then it's just going to eat at him, eat at him. It's going to be like Bruce Wayne in the dark Knight returns where he's just <laughs> like, he's going to think he's done. And then on a thundery night, he's going to hear the voice in his head and he's going to come back and direct. But it is the difference between some Someone who is telling a lie and someone who is something that is crap. <laughs> like you said, he, he actually is saying it's the truth and it is the truth per what he thinks, but it's crap. It's not real. Yeah, I, I, at the risk of overloading our audience with another sports reference, I'm going to say that he wishes he could be like Tim Duncan and walk away, but still be like a coach. Maybe he could be a producer. Maybe he could help out his friends and like like fold them some money or give them a directorial eye. But even that is going to gnaw away at him. Quentin Tarantino is going to become the George Costanza of cinema, where he quits every <laughs> Friday and then he walks back on Monday like he never said anything. And that's why we love you, Quentin. Keep making stuff. We love it. All right, what's next? The first image of Gary Oldman as British Prime Minister Winston <clears throat> Churchill has been released for Darkest Hour, the World War II drama from Antonin and Hannah filmmaker Joe Wright. The film takes place in the days following Churchill's appointment to the Prime Minister role as he tries to negotiate a peace treaty with Nazi Germany or stand firm to his country's ideals and fight. The film opens in theaters on November 24, 2017. Jeremy, buy or sell Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill from Darkest Hour. No pressure to anyone at this table, but if you don't buy this, I'm beating you to death with this microphone. <laughs> I'm saying, like, this is the most impressive. It reminds me of when I saw Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln for the first time. I, I kind of feel like that's what they were going for with mm, the picture that itself. Side yeah, yeah, for, yeah, for sure. That side angle where you're like, that's Churchill. Just like I was like, that is Lincoln. Like, I am. I instantly started looking forward to this film tenfold after I saw that picture of Gary Oldman looking just like Winston Churchill. Buy it. Kenny. Uh, first of all, welcome to the team. There's some workplace violence issues we need to talk about <laughs> right. here. Uh, look, uh, I'm going to buy it, but, but I'll tell you what, I've been slowly transitioning into this look all my life, and I'm not going to get the credit <laughs> that Gary Oldman has for this, all right? Um, There's a side floor yeah. file. Oh, we just missed <laughs> it. Yeah, I'll do that. The glass of whiskey and throw the cigar. Um, Look, I course buy it. What an amazing transition. There's a little bit of makeup and prosthetics I've heard, but that's just, I mean, if you didn't tell me, I'd be like, oh, they got a picture of Winston Churchill. It's right. Gary Oldman, the guy from Fifth Element? No way. <laughs> I'm intrigued. I mentioned last week I love World War II films and the, and the history there. And, and uh, this d movie, Darkest Hour, sounds really good. We got a lot about other aspects of World War II. We don't get a lot about Churchill, who's a fascinating character. Yeah, I'm going I'm to buy this for a couple of reasons. Number one, you're right. When you look at him, you just instantly think that's Churchill. Yeah. What you do not think is that's Gary Oldman. Like, I'm still not convinced that that's Gary Oldman. I mean, that's kind of crazy. The other reason I'm really excited about this is because I've been getting into that new Netflix series, The Crown, and you got another world-class actor in Jonathan Lithgow playing, uh, uh, playing Churchill. Winston Churchill right now, and it's not the best fit. Lithgow playing Churchill isn't the best fit. This guy playing Churchill I think is great. So for all those reasons more, I'm going to buy it. Look, I know he was British. I know we don't have a prime minister in America. Can I vote for that guy tomorrow? Like, I'd really love to show up and write in. Either Winston Churchill or Gary Oldman. Either way, I'm going to buy the hell out of this. The only thing that I will sell is alongside Kenny's sentiments is that somebody took a picture of us at our first pre-production meeting with Jeremy. And in said picture, I didn't know I was being photographed. I look remarkably <laughs> like Winston Churchill. <laughs> I just tweeted it out, and I'm ashamed of my... I worked out this morning, and I still look like that. All right, guys. Well, listen, we do this show live, and at the end of the show, we're going to save a little bit of time for your live Twitter questions. You can start sending in your live Twitter questions now. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and send on in your question. Wendy is going to be picking a couple out, but I also want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider today. A little bit later, TV Talk drops at 5 p.m. going into everything about television. Also, the newest Crash Course is going up today. We got a new Harry Potter Universe movie coming out, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. So who is this guy that's the lead of it, Newt Scamander? That's the focus of the new Crash Course video. That goes up a little bit later today. Also, the latest Walking Dead TV review went up last night. It's on our channel right now. And also, the Arrival non-spoiler review with Dennis and Perry went up a little bit earlier today. You can go and check that out there as well. Well, with that out of the way, it's time for us to get to Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you want us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. 
Mom. Send on in your questions. We got a couple today. So Ashley, what do we got? Eric Pinna writes, is it me or does it seem like Fantastic Beasts and where to find them doesn't really have a marketing push behind it. I barely see anything related to it on TV or on the internet. I remember seeing a teaser before Force Awakens, but when I went to see Doctor Strange, they didn't have a trailer in front of it. Um, it, well, I, I guess it depends on what movies you're seeing because I, I, I go, all of us at the table, we go to a lot of movies. For me, myself, I've seen a lot of marketing for the movie. I mean, maybe not, in, I can't remember if I saw an ad for it in front of Doctor Strange or not, but I've seen it in front of a lot of movies, so I don't think there's any lack of push. And driving around Los Angeles, you got Newt's Commander posters all over the place as well, so personally I've seen a lot of the marketing what do you think yeah Eric I don't know where you live I'm sorry Kenny left you at Burning Man and didn't give you a ride <laughs> back but there is a lot of Fantastic Beast marketing going on I've seen a lot uh, when I watch TV my primary mm -hmm. channels are ESPN and Cartoon Network and I've seen it both of those places and when I see I, I, I didn't see Doctor Strange in theaters like I didn't pay money to see it because I'm just lucky, and I have <laughs> not seen it in tra in theaters as much as I thought I would, but I think that's going to start to ramp up, obviously, in the next couple of weeks. Jeremy, you seen a lot of ads for this thing? I have seen a lot of ads for that thing. In fact, yesterday, didn't I tell you, we, we drove by the Warner's lot, and the Warner's lot, oh, that's the tower right. has a Fantastic Beast banner around it. The that's Warner's right. tower is now the Fantastic Beast banner. It's so. actually, Warner's is now guarded by real beasts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. As, uh, I mean, it's, it's out there. I've seen it on TV. The, the movie trailer thing, sometimes there are politics that play between movie uh, theater chains and studios that could compromise and shift around trailers as I'm just saying it happens um, but it could just be the theater that you were at but I've seen a lot personally okay I did see Doctor Strange in a the theater, and I paid for it because a vote for me is a vote for the working class people. All right, Mark <laughs> Ellis. All right, uh, and there was a giant, giant display of Newt's Commander. But it might be where you live, Eric, or you might be comparing it to The Force Awakens or even Rogue One. There's that I'm seeing compared to some of the bigger <laughs> marketing machines. There is a lot of business and politics. I worked at a movie theater too in my youth. You know, a lot of weird things happen. What comes in and what plays before what? But I think it's out there. Maybe though, that's a question of are they doing a good job educating people to be like, there's no Harry Potter in this one. It's just the same universe. Well, like That's I said, a, we got a, a Crash Course video coming a little mm -hmm. bit later today on Newt's Commander, hosted and run by our very own Ashley Mova. Yeah. So you want to check that out. But Ashley, <laughs> have you seen much advertising for it? You, you think know, there's been a lack of it? I think it's... I've seen a, a lack of it. I don't think that the common movie going audience even knows that this is related to Harry Potter. I think I know of it because we come in here, we talk about it every day, but if I was just a normal person off the street, I don't think that people really get to see this like as much as they should or compared to other movies, I guess. I'll just say this. I think that Fantastic Beast has done a better job, maybe not the best job, but a better job of letting the audience know that it's tied to the Harry Potter universe and comes out before that ever happened than Rogue One has done, telling the common people that this movie is a Star Wars film but takes place before the events of A New Hope. Or that Prometheus ever did, letting people know that it was tied to the <laughs> Aliens universe at all. It's all right. still according in the air as to whether I'm or not that is. Give me one there. alien with a mouth coming out. Come on. All right, what's the next mailbag question? Raymond Verrata writes, is there a time limit or lead time for spoiler alerts? It's like Star Wars The Force Awakens came out a year ago or The Walking Dead premiere happened two weeks ago and people still demand a spoiler alert. I think the people who don't watch with the majority after a few days, okay, a week, lose all rights to a spoiler alert. I find it's annoying that we should be denied talking about something great in TV or movies just to appease a few who would whine about what they haven't seen yet. I find it strange on some of your shows you still go spoiler alert for movies that have been shown years or even decades ago. Let me know your thoughts. Here's, look, I, I did a video on this once actually, a long time ago. The thing that makes spoilers such a hot issue and a hot button for a lot of people is that there is no agreed upon definition for what is a spoiler. Like, so there'll be some people that would be like, oh, did you know that, uh, I, I don't know, um, Eddie Redmayne's gonna be in that movie coming out next month. Ah, spoiler! I didn't know he was in it. Well, it's on IMDb, it's there, it's publicly acknowledged. It's But you know, there are some people who think any bit of information about any movie or any television show is a spoiler. There are some people like me that I think if it's been in the marketing or it's publicly available knowledge or it's ever been acknowledged by an official source, 
It's no longer a spoiler. I also believe that if a movie's been in theaters and then it's been on home video, DVD, or streaming for at least a week or more, you've had plenty of time to see it. And if you haven't seen it by then, at some point, the fan community, including us who do shows like this, we've got to be able to be free to openly discuss it. So, but the big problem is, is there's been no agreed upon definition. What is a spoiler? What isn't a spoiler? Everybody's got different ideas about it. And I don't know, maybe there's an idea there somewhere where those of us here in this office, maybe our buddies at Screen Junkies and maybe our buddies at Cinema Sins, maybe a whole group of us should get together and draft for fans. Mm -hmm. This is the fan proclamation that we believe as fans we should agree upon. This is what a spoiler is. I don't know, Kenny, what's the answer to this? Look, climate change is important, but there needs to be some legislation about this. All right? <laughs> we need to put this in the hands of our politicians because we trust them to figure this out. But you're right. It's also frustrating. Look, both ways. I generally go with a 24-hour rule or give people a chance for television for television but also you know at some point you have to talk about things what i don't like is maybe you switch your avatar picture to a, 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 a picture of joffrey in a key moment of the thing and now i have no option but to see it and i didn't maybe get a chance to not see that spoiler it's also become a bit of a joke about uh you know crying game spoil alert the movie came out in the early 90s all right suck it up and watch it there has to be we have to talk about it as business and as fans we have to talk about it but also don't forget you don't have to log on to Twitter and Facebook. If you know something might be spoiled for you in that time show, movies might be different. Uh, you know, you could put down the phone, go for a walk, go outside, <laughs> get a milkshake, have a good day. So it is tough, though. It's a weird balance. Part of the reason I think we in our business also seem to go overboard with going spoiler is if we don't, we get attacked. And that's just not good for business, and it's also just basically annoying, too, when you're trying to do your work, and all day you're getting tweet-bombed with. Uh, you didn't give me a spoiler alert, didn't give me a spoiler alert, so maybe we're being cautious on that side. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the important thing to know is we're all, like, movie fans and cinephiles over here, so, I mean, we don't want to ruin anything for people, you know? That's why. It's like, worst-case scenario, we say spoiler alert to brace that person who might have come across a spoiler, so they have that option to turn it off. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I have a rule that 6 p.m. Pacific time, which is 9 p.m. New York time, Sunday night, I log off all social media and I will see you when I get The Walking Dead through my eyes into my brain. Um, I've actually logged off for a couple days before because I didn't get to watch it for a couple days. And that's how you can, you can log off, like Ken said. Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, a few... Like The Force Awakens, we can talk about The Force Awakens now because it's, what is it, the highest grossing domestic box office movie? <laughs> yeah, I feel like seen enough it, people see have seen The Force Awakens. But yeah, there definitely is a time variance, but just err on the side of caution is what I do. Mark? Here's a little bit of insight into how my mind works is whether I'm on camera or I'm just in a normal conversation, I'm on stage. Inside my brain, there's a little head coach and he's got one of those play sheets. And anytime <laughs> the issue of a spoiler alert comes up, he's looking at that play sheet and scratching his head like he's considering going for two or not and you just don't know what to do because there's so many factors there's so many things you have to consider what's the medium is it tv is it a movie is it a streaming thing what is the form that you're giving it away and is it just a typical conversation is it a show like movie talk where people are watching for us to talk about movies there's so many factors to consider i would love for us to try to come up with a play sheet and be like okay well it's walking dead and that was that week and then this but like even something like Derek devil which comes out or luke cage it comes out and it's 13 episodes and people binge that over a day do you have to wait 13 weeks to give it away what do you do i did a video one time for schmoes a couple years ago and i mentioned the death that happens in a little independent film called top gun <laughs> and people killed me because they said I gave away the movie. And I'm like, it came out in 1986. What are you? <laughs> so it really is. It, it's a, Unfortunately, there's some things in life that are just feel out processes. And you have to feel out the situation you're in and try not to give it away. All right, guys, I said we'd save a little bit of time. Take some of your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. Again, make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Wendy, what have you picked out? First one comes from Man Among Legends. He writes, thoughts on Ben's Batman script is a mess, and Warner Brothers don't care because the global audience won't see it in English anyway. This drove me crazy. There's this story that came out, story, that came out last week where this guy says he talked to some guys who say they talked to some other guys who said that the Batman script was a total mess. Mm. Um, 
that is just not something anybody should ever run with a story. Somebody who's not attached to the Batman film, talk to some other guys who are also not attached to, to a Batman film, say they talk to some other guy that is hearsay on top of hearsay on top of hearsay. That's not something that should be run with as a story. But a lot of people ran with it as a story. And now, sure enough, the original guy, who's, who's a writer, by the way, the original guy has come out and said, let me clarify. I don't know anybody attached to the Batman films. The people who I talk to aren't attached to the Batman films. And I simply was trying to say this. And it totally changed the story. So it, it, this, this kind of is an example of why we need to be very, very cautious. Number one, as publishers of, of content, to not run with something and claim it as fact when you have no idea what the source of that is whatsoever. And second of all, it's a lesson to us as fans as well to be very careful about the information we're consuming and to look into it a little bit ourselves as well because as it turns out this whole thing was bubkiss uh to go with so yeah this whole thing kind of drove me nuts i don't know if you guys have anything you, you gotta to consider that. john these guys that talk to guys that know guys have a pretty decent track record they're the same <laughs> ones that told us that Spaceballs 2 is coming out because there were three posters in a subway and they're the same exact people that told us that batman v superman is being split into two movies enter the night and dawn of justice they know their crap yeah, it's a tale as old as gossip time. It's like a guy who knows a girl, the Ferris passed out at 31 Flavors last night. It didn't happen. Then you throw in social media in there, it would have been worse. Nine like, times. This is the era of scoops and inside information. And you know what? Sometimes it might be true. We heard some stuff about Suicide Of course, yes, sometimes it yeah. is. So that's why it's up to us and it's up to the people reporting to double check, triple check. And just be careful. You could be affecting someone's job, someone's career, and just creating some kind of hoopla over something that doesn't need to be. Like... The Rogue One reshoots had me worried for a little bit, only because I just kept reading these stories. But, uh, you know, when I dug into it more, not so much, not so worried. This definitely seems like, uh, you know, uh, just, just some, some rumors being spread. And, and that's unfortunate that that happens, and it's going to happen in this, in this scoop era that we're in. You know, and like, just to be clear, we're all movie fans, so I don't right. mind. Like, and there were a couple of sites that, were, that wrote about this, but they wrote about the right way. They, like, they started off their paragraphs with, look, we have no idea if this is true, because coming from a completely, like, three states, steps removed sources we don't know but let's throw this out there and talk about it i'm totally for because that's what yeah. as fans we do but man i just saw so many headlines where it was like batman script or mess says studio sources i was like what that's <laughs> it was completely misleading all right anyway what's next all right next one comes from james hollock who writes thoughts on michael giacchino composing for spider-man homecoming i i think it's great look michael giacchino is gonna is turning into one of these guys where he is it's it's too soon to call him the next john williams but certainly there are certain people trying to position him to be the next John Williams. And you know what? As long as he keeps cranking out these soundtracks that are as good as they are, I got no problem with that. I believe he is the future of the Star Wars franchise when it comes to music. I think that John Williams is going to be passing the baton on to him and he's going to be the future of it. Um, so the fact that he's doing Spider-Man Homecoming, I, I think is great. He's gonna, probably going to be doing like five or six movies a year. But that, that's going to be one of them I think is great. I'm actually excited. I'm excited for this opportunity for him because the things that I most know him for are where he took an iconic score, was able to spin it into his own thing and make something new out of it, like what he did with Jurassic World or what hopefully he will do with Rogue One. So here with Spider-Man, I know there's been a lot of Spider-Man movies. I don't really have an iconic score from any of them in my head. As long as he doesn't borrow any tunes from Nickelback, I am good to go. <laughs> but you know what? Like, he did that already as well with the Star Trek franchise. Because whether you like or don't That's like great Star point, Trek, yeah. that new Star Trek thing, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Uh, I, it's really good and I enjoy it. so he's he has that knack for taking properties that have existing iconic mm -hmm. music and then bringing something of his own to it and he's done a pretty good job of it yeah we're, we're entering a time it's like a bittersweet time where our heroes that we grew up with whether they be actors directors uh, musicians composers they're they're getting older and they're not able to work you know, and so they're going to have to pass these batons to a younger generation. So it's exciting to see these new stars rise, but it is sad to see these uh, these icons that we so love um, age. Yeah, we're, it, new legends are being formed, right. and this is probably the case with him. I think you guys are all right. You touch on he's great at playing in someone else's established sandbox and making it his own, and his he's risen out of that to be yeah. to be in this position. I'm still holding on to the next John Williams. It's still John Williams for episode eight and hopefully nine. Right. But uh, yeah, this is, seems like a, a no win. Uh, I, I mean, decision. he is doing a that is factual. He is doing a. I have a feeling you're going to see sooner or later that Michael Giacchino is going to be the episode nine composer. I got a mm. feeling that's probably at some point going to be announced. All right, let's take two more. 
more. Okay, James Thomas Walsh writes, well, Gal Gadot's uh, announced pregnancy affect the DCCU? Well, I mean, I don't know if it'll affect the DCU any more than um, uh, Black Widow. Uh, Scarlett. Uh, Scarlett Johansson's pregnancy affected Age of Ultron or anything else they did. They will work around it. They have their plan. They know what they're doing. Will it cause some inconvenience for the production? Absolutely. But guess what? Having a kid's a little bit more important than any of that. But they, they have line producers that are masters of this they have to work around this kind of stuff all the time i think from a fan's perspective we won't see a bump in the road what do you think kenny i absolutely agree and it shouldn't affect it she should have this right to have a <laughs> yes. second child so it shouldn't affect it if it is then dcu is doing something wrong i don't yeah i don't think i think they probably plan for it i'm sure she was like hey guys by the way got a little project i'm working on on the side here uh so uh don't have me show up in uh, this movie that i think it's going to be fine Not jeremy worried. yeah it's funny because people don't they don't think about there is that time in between where someone can have a child, it's totally fine, and live a life, and it won't actually affect the movie. I mean, maybe delay it a little bit. It'll be, I, I, I agree with you, they'll work around it, and we'll all be fine in the movie. <laughs> You look great, gal. <laughs> and let's not forget, too, just because she's pregnant, that doesn't mean now there are nine months that she cannot work. <laughs> yeah, right. No, not at all. I mean, somebody on our staff was pregnant and... John, don't talk about my business, please. <laughs> <laughs> and we did not know for like seven of yeah. those months. I mean, so look, she's good. So they will have plenty of time that they can work with her, and then they'll just schedule around her. No pro I don't know how do you it. It does this? cause a ripple in craft services. Y'all better have some peanut butter, some pickles, some Reese's Pieces on hand. And just in case, because I know the cravings happen, and I get them even though I'm not pregnant currently. <laughs> All right, last question of the day. All right, last one comes from Cut to Black Film, who writes, if someone wanted to get to where you are now, what advice would you give them? Um, I, I throw to this a lot. There is a video that I made a couple of years ago. It's online. It's called Getting Started in YouTubing, Podcasting, Blogging, etc. Uh, just search uh, John Campia Getting Started on YouTube. You'll find it's a two-hour video where I try to put in as much information, suggestions, and, and uh, little tips for getting started in this sort of thing. It's really the best thing I can recommend. So once again, hop on YouTube to search for like start like i said about two hours long i hope you'll find it helpful do you guys have any like tidbits you want to throw i mean out look there? It, it's hard to recreate what i've been able to do because nobody has that mix of a microphone available and a desperate need for attention but if you <laughs> want to be more like me keep sweating from those armpits keep eating baby carrots and most importantly keep growing those eyebrows jeremy how can somebody if I, if I woke up today and said i want to be jeremy johns what's the first thing i got to do um you you have to not try at all because <laughs> what i did was i just wanted to talk on camera and just just have fun on the internet now my channel is thankfully where it is and these guys were like hey we'd love you to be at collider and move down here and i did that too all for the sake of trying to not have a boss it was really <laughs> kind of productive it really was but uh yeah be yourself uh talk about what you love uh, be passionate and be honest. I think the key to being Jeremy Johns is not waking up in the morning, though. Oh, yeah, it's afternoon. Like oh, a, late night. That's, that's when your I'm telling yeah. you, that's when the brain works the best. <laughs> what do you think, Ken? Uh, look, watch your video, John. Listen to this guy. Listen to Mark. But I'll give you the advice that my friend Roger Craig Smith gave me and gave a lot of people. He's a big voiceover guy, Assassin's Creed, Sonic, all the stuff. He says, you can't have my path. I did a long 17 year journey in LA doing sketch comedy, pro wrestling, stand up comedy. I met Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis 12 years ago and that led to me to this point today. You sometimes don't know where your career is going to go. You just have to work hard. You have to take it seriously and have fun while you're doing it and hang out with Jeremy Johns every now and then. <laughs> Ashley, would you give anybody any, adv any advice? Um, mostly I'm shocked. Ken, you were a pro wrestler. Did I just hear that you were a pro wrestler? I co-owned a pro wrestling company. Oh, still do. And, and and I have been in a hardcore match or two. Whoa. <laughs> wow. My goodness. You can I, find the ring in our garage. I have, I have the kendo stick in my car. I'll bring it in for you. <laughs> I can't wait to check that out. Um, I would just say... Um, you know, in the words of Nike, just do it. Like, don't listen to anyone around you. Just go do what you need to do to complete things and get to where you want to be in life. Because if you listen to what other people are saying, you're never going to you're never going to get there. Wendy? I agree. I mean, be like Nike, be like Shia LaBeouf, just do it. And I think it also, it just depends on how badly you really want it. If you yeah. want it badly enough, you can get to it. And don't like look at, for example, like YouTube. Don't be like, oh, I only have 500 subscribers. We were all at 500 subscribers at one point. Eventually, you're going to get to 1 million or whatever. So just keep it going. You just do it. That, that, that's a really good point. Like The more I planned on doing something, the more I just didn't do that something. So yeah. if you have your stuff, you're like, but I'm not ready to do it that's when you should just do it just and stop I, talking about it i think the best advice is you just put on a little movie called animal house and what do they say in that 
heartfelt film, my advice to you is to keep drinking heavily. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it for us, guys, for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, the most important part of our show is not what we have to say, it's what you have to say. Make sure you jump into the comments section below and leave your thoughts on any or all of the topics we discussed here today. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, the, the new guys over oh. here. First of all, on the far part there, Kenny. Kenny, where can people find uh, you You can online? follow me at Ken Napsack across all social media platforms and not the dating ones. I apologize for that, but really, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jeremy Johns, welcome. Welcome to your first official oh, show. Thank Where can you, people sir. find you? Uh, you can find me at Jeremy Johns on uh, Twitter, YouTube, uh, Instagram, uh, at Real Jeremy Johns on Facebook. Um, happy to be here, and I swiped right for you. I'm just saying. I really think <laughs> you Ken. better. Mr. Mark Ellis, where can people find you? I am Ken's wingman on FarmersOnly.com, and you can also find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. And check out Christian Harlow and I's YouTube channel, Schmoes No. Sitting over there, of course, we got Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And, of course, Wendy Lee. On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. You guys can follow me on all social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at John Campy. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ where John Schnepp and I have our weekly show, Film HQ, new episodes every Saturday. That'll do it for us, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.